And if someone wants to alleviate their gender distress after they're 18, on their 18th birthday, would you be okay with them getting what you've termed cosmetic surgery to have their genitals lopped off? I would want those people to become, uh, to, to come to accept themselves as their actual sex. I think that's much more compassionate. You know, a lot of times TERFs get accused of being, you know, mean and non-compassionate. Why can't we just be nice? I think the nicest thing and the most compassionate thing we can do is to help people, children or adults, to accept themselves as their actual sex. Welcome to Conversations with Peter Bogosian. I had a lovely talk with Kara Dansky, author of The Reckoning, about feminism, trans issues, the Democrats, and a whole host of other contentious topics. Thanks. Kara Dansky, welcome. Thanks for coming to London to have a conversation with me. Thanks so much uh, for having me. I love your t-shirt. Can you explain it to us, please? Thank you. Yes, my t-shirt says infamous turf writer. And what this comes from is a little clip by a man named Sam Sater. I don't know if you've come across Sam. I, I Sam, have, unfortunately. Sam uh, likes to say a lot of things on YouTube about TERFs. And there was one episode where he and his guests were talking about a Twitter exchange, the X, excuse me, that I had had with a guy called Chris Rufo, who I'm sure your viewers also know. Uh, Chris had jumped into the scene and started talking about gender identity. And a lot of women on Twitter got very upset at him for jumping into the scene when women have been talking about this for a very long time. It's a very common dynamic that happens. And uh, I offered, I, thought, I genuinely meant it as a sincere offer to talk with him and to explain why so many women were angry at him. And he got really mad at me. So this exchange ended up on Sam Sater's show with a graphic who, who of- Who got mad at you, Sam? Chris. Chris got mad at you? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm yeah, he got, yeah, he got mad at me and said, I don't, need to care what feminists think or okay. something like that. Okay. And so this exchange ended up on Sam's show with the image of my first book, which is called The Abolition of Sex. And one of his guests referred to me as an infamous turf writer. And a friend of mine thought that was very funny and made me this t-shirt. So what, two questions. One, what is a feminist? And then do we need to care what feminists think? What is a feminist? So a feminist is someone who cares about the liberation of women, is a woman who cares about the liberation of women, in a particular uh, radical feminists, uh, radical here referring to going to the root. And so from a radical feminist perspective, it's the oppression of women as a class by men as a class that feminists need to be chiefly concerned with. Interesting. So you have to be a woman to be a feminist? In radical feminist views, yes. Oh, okay. So just so that I understand, so what's liberation then? What do you mean by that? So we would like to see a world in which women are not exploited by, subjugated by, or oppressed by men as a class. There's a lot that can go into that. We can talk about, for example, uh, a leftist radical feminist critique of anti-abortion laws. Um, I'm the president of an organization called Women's Declaration International USA, which is staunchly in support of abortion laws, of, of abortion rights. Um, for women, specifically as a sex class. So there's a lot that goes with feminism. We are anti-surrogacy, we're anti-pornography, we're anti-prostitution. We are very much pro-laws and policies that protect women and girls as a sex class. Okay, let's, let, let, let me break, the, we could literally do hours on those four. Anti-surrogacy, anti-prostitution. Yep. What else? Pornography. Against pornography, what else? Gender. What about gender? Gender in all its forms. So are you against the idea of gender? Radical feminists object to gender, meaning sex stereotypes. And we view gender identity as a subset of gender. Okay. Or as a, as a type of gender. And you, you self, I love this. I'm going to co-opt the phrase. You self-identify as a radical feminist? Sure. And what's the difference between a radical feminist and a feminist? It depends on who you ask, but I would say in today's world, We've got radical feminists who are holding the line for women and girls as a sex class. And then you've got these other groups, organizations, and individuals, including Planned Parenthood, including the National Organization for Women, the National Center for Lesbian Rights, you name it. Any of the mainstream so-called feminist organizations are betraying women and girls. Okay, so I'd like to go over those if that's okay. So one thing that I've been trying to understand, in a nutshell, what is the issue with surrogacy? What's the problem with it? It's essentially renting a woman's body. 
it's exploiting a woman's body and it's also selling children when it's done commercially. But don't, don't we rent people's bodies? Isn't that what an economy is? We rent people's minds, we rent their bodies like any manual labor is a kind of renting? Well, no. I mean, from a feminist perspective, you're specifically renting a woman's body for her reproductive capacity and her reproductive organs. That but, is yeah. an extreme form of exploitation of women's bodies. But you could say that about men, too, like guys who work on oil rigs, right? Like you're renting a man's body. Like I, I think there must be something about this that I'm fundamentally not getting. I think the concept of labor is very different from the concept of exploiting a woman's body for her reproductive capacity. I mean, you could argue that all labor is renting a person's body. That's what I was thinking, yeah. Yeah, but that would be kind of a weird argument to make. I see that as fundamentally different from literally renting a woman's body for the sole purpose of using her reproductive organs. So would you be against sperm donation? So when you get into larger questions of IVF and sperm donation and those kinds of things, I think that, get, that starts to get very complicated. Ultimately, I think that if a man wants to donate his sperm and a woman wants to use that sperm to have and raise her own children, it's hard for me to object to that. That strikes me as very different. So from... they're disanalogous, those two things. Sure. Okay, so the main objection to surrogacy is it's renting a woman's body uh, for her, it's, it's renting a woman's reproductive organs. Yeah, it's also very dangerous for those women. Oh, because like you can die in childbirth? That, but that's always true. But it's also dangerous for the women because they get lots of hormones that women don't get when they become pregnant naturally. Uh, it wreaks havoc on women's bodies. Oh, interesting. I, di I didn't know that, but... There's also... My like exogenous hormones? Like they yeah. pump them in? Oh, interesting. Yeah. And my understanding from people who know much more about the surrogacy industry than I do is that there's a lot of exploitation involved in the contract process. So a lot of times women will get involved in a surrogacy arrangement without fully understanding what she's taking on. Would you be against surrogacy? How much is the average surrogate in the United States? That I don't know. If, if I'm, I'm just completely plucking this number out and if this is unfair, let me know. Like if it were $100,000, I think that's a fee that I saw, would you still be against surrogacy if it were a million dollars? Yeah, it's not about the amount. Okay. Okay, so the, the other thing is um, you, you mentioned pornography. I find this fascinating because I also don't think I understand this. What is the basic argument against pornography? Again, it's exploiting women's bodies, especially today when pornography is so ubiquitous, it is so violent, it is so degrading toward women as a sex class. Would you be against gay pornography? Uh, involving men two, exclusively? Two, two guys, yeah. I don't even have any interest in thinking about that. But um, so as a feminist, my primary concern is for women and girls as a sex class. Okay. And so when we get into conversations about whether the same principles apply to men and boys, yeah. it's really difficult because... Radical feminists view the world as a situation in which men as a class are oppressing women as a class. Now, if that were not true, I might have a different view of gay pornography. But as long as it's true that men as a class oppress women as a, sec as women as a class, then I think the analysis changes. And my objections to pornography involving male violence against women don't apply in the game. What would it look like in a world in which men as a class were not exploiting women as a class? Like, what would society look like? So that is a much longer conversation okay. um, that we could definitely have. But, I mean, for example, in, okay. the con in the examples that we're talking about, there would be no surrogacy. There would be no pornography. There would be no violence against women. There would be no rape. So, so and women would be able to do whatever they, whatever they want in terms of their own reproductive health. So... There would be no, what about two guys who are gay who want to have, like draw that line for me so I can understand like, so, oh, oh, is, is, is it like if two gay guys want to get a surrogate to have a baby, the claim is that that is itself intrinsically patriarchal or oppressive and so the disjunct comes because the act itself is a kind of a, a 
uh, operationalized oppression. Is that the idea? I'm not sure it's worse for a gay male couple to buy a baby via surrogacy than for a straight couple to buy a baby via surrogacy. The problem for radical feminists is the exploitation of the woman in question and the sale and purchase of the child. That's fascinating to me. Is, is radical feminism then a, a kind of identity politics? No, because woman is not an identity. So this is where it gets really interesting okay, and somewhat yeah. frustrating okay. when conservatives... So I, I should just say, in terms of where I'm coming from politically, yeah. most of my work is involving bringing a radical feminist leftist critique of gender identity. I'm not a conservative and I never have been a conservative. Okay. So part of the frustration of all of this is that conservatives often accuse feminists of playing identity politics. Correct. But from my perspective, that is absolutely not true because woman is not an identity. If it were, then I would be much more open to the criticism. But the whole idea that woman is an identity is a really big problem for radical feminists in critiquing gender identity. I see. So I hate to ask this because it's been asked and it, it's played, but it's very difficult to have a conversation without asking this. What, what do you, I, feel, I feel like a moron by asking this, but what do you mean by a woman? Would like, how do you define what, because it's essential to, to make sure that we're on the same page as we, because I'm about to ask you about trans too in a minute. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So a woman is an adult human female. Okay. It should not be at all complicated. And I should also just say that is not a matter of my opinion. Right. Right? Like that is just true. And so if somebody says that that's not the case, then that's false. Objectively speaking, yeah. Is there a valid use of the word woman without an adult human female? I'm not sure what you mean. Like, uh, is there a kind of woman who's not an adult human yeah. female? No. So what about all the people who, who claim to be w women who were born natal men? So they're men. <laughs> okay, well then that, then, then, then that answers that question. So, um, yeah, an adult human male is a man. Okay. Even if he claims to have an identity that suggests otherwise. Okay, one of the things that we see over and over again is the conflation of the terms male and men, women and female. C can you help us disambiguate those terms, define or explain those? Or So I would say that the word male is different from the word men okay. in the sense that lots of beings are male who aren't humans. Right? So a man is an adult human male. Right. There are male cats, right? So that's not a man. A male, male cat cats, is not right. a man. Right, right. <laughs> um, but a, a man is an adult human male. A man is an adult human male, and there are males that are not men, like a dog. So all men are males, but not all males are men. Sure. Okay. So who wants to conjoin those categories of male and men? Is it TERFs? Is it trans activists? Is it... So this is part of what is so difficult about the entire conversation around so-called gender identity, which is that sometimes people who claim to be proponents of gender identity will say that there's a difference between sex and gender, and sometimes they'll say there's no difference between sex and gender, and the goalposts keep moving. Right. So that's part of why it becomes very difficult for what I refer to as normies, which are neither radical feminists nor so-called trans activists, but just regular average people. It becomes very confusing for regular average people to navigate any of this yes, it because does. the I goalposts of gender identity agree. keep shifting. One of the claims that I've heard, we're gonna to talk to someone who has a popular YouTube channel uh, Stephen, Stephen Woodford. And one of the claims that he makes is that um, uh, n nobody's saying that sex isn't real. So are there, are there any trans activists, for example, who are saying, can you give me the name of, of, of someone? If there is someone, maybe he's correct. Uh, I am aware of one very well-known uh, individual in the United States named Chase Strangio. Chase is the Deputy Director for Transgender Justice at the American Civil Liberties Union. Full disclosure, my former employer, I used to work there, we could talk about that if you'd right. like. I saw that um, in there, yeah. 
So Chase has argued that sex is a, is a legal construct that the state legislature of the state of North Carolina invented in 2016. Now, I really am not sure why Chase gets away with claiming that sex was invented by any state, let alone North Carolina in 2016. <laughs> I understand that Chase is referring to the so-called bathroom bill yes, that was yes, in play in North correct. Carolina. Um, but the idea that biological sex is a legal construct that was invented by a United States state legislature strikes me as patently absurd. Okay, so help me understand something. Why would somebody claim that nobody is claiming something when people are claiming it? Because in the land of gender identity, you just get to get away with saying whatever you want. You can lie, you can do whatever you it's want, simple, say whatever you want, and say, I'm trans and you get away with it. That's just what happens. But the difficulty comes when you try to have a conversation about it. That's certainly true. Right, so uh, recently there was an evolutionary biologist named Colin Wright, who I'm sure you're He's familiar with. He's gonna be on the show tomorrow. Fabulous. A friend of mine. Um, and he was engaged in a Twitter conversation with someone else, and I forget his name. His first name was Ian, I forget his last name. Okay. And this Ian person was arguing that sex is a spectrum. and Colin Wright, of course, disagrees with that and is very clear that sex is binary, we're mammals, etc. And the arguments that this other person kept advancing was, was that sex is a spectrum because there are people who have anomalies, chromosomal anomalies, which is true, right? The vast majority of us are either XX or XY, but there are some people who have a different chromosomal makeup. That is true, it's a medical condition. And his argument was that because that is true, Therefore, sex is a spectrum and gender ident identity makes sense. Okay, so let's say that there are people who genuinely believe the most extreme thing, sex is a construct, the less extreme thing, that woman is a construct, and say they, they genuinely believe this. What is the reason they genuinely, I mean, I know, I know this might be a little bit out of your purview, but w what is the reason, why do you think that they, they claim to genuinely believe that? I don't know if I can be persuaded that anyone actually does believe that, but for the sake of argument, okay. because of the way you set it up, uh, people have been lied to. People have just been consistently lied to by all of our institutions, our educational institutions. Um, young people in particular are being taught this stuff at very young ages, and people have been lied to by, by our corporations, right? Businesses push this stuff all the time. Um, they've been lied to by the media. Uh, Jennifer Billick uh, writes at the 11th Hour blog, and she's got some great pieces on how the word transgender just became like, you know, we, we were just assaulted by it starting at around 2014, 2015, and we all were sort of um, persuaded to believe that, is a, that it is a coherent category of people. So to the extent that people sincerely believe in this stuff, I'm willing to believe that it's because they've been lied to and they've been persuaded to by all of our institutions. So they're kind of, they've been hoodwinked. Sure. So what, what about the idea that they want to be inclusive to trans people who are marginalized and oppressed? So I don't know if I will ever understand um, okay. why inclusion is an important value in our society or on like the left. Like including different people in the, in the cultural milieu yeah, I get the concept of it, but I don't really understand it. I, like, I don't understand how inclusion came to even be an important value. I, you know, it, like, this gets at your point you made earlier about yeah. linguistics, right? The word discrimination and how it's used in our society drives me nuts because there's nothing inherently wrong with discriminating, Correct. right? It's an important skill. It's an important critical thinking skill. And our society has gotten the idea that any form of discrimination is bad. I actually think sometimes exclusion is perfectly appropriate, for example, women's spaces, sports, prisons, etc. right? Like there's nothing wrong with excluding men from women's bathrooms. That should be totally normal. But somehow this idea that inclusion is an important value has taken over. And I don't know if I will ever understand why. Do you think certain forms of inclusion can lead to liberation? What might be an example? Let me also say, to yeah. the extent that inclusion it refers to something like the end of insidious racial discrimination from Jim Crow. Great. That was a really important civil rights victory. Yeah. Um, but desegregation, I don't know how we got from that to inclusion. 
Why, like, why do we have to include everybody in everything? That just doesn't make sense to me. You can kick me out of here at any time if you want, and I can't really make a complaint against you. <laughs> you know, you don't have to include me in this conversation. It's right. just weird to me. Right. I've been thinking about this, this word feminism. Like, is this even a useful word? What, in philosophy, you, you, you talk about terms of doing work. What work does the word feminist do, or feminism? From a radical feminist perspective, the work that feminism does, the word feminism, yeah. is that it, it is a word to describe a political movement to liberate women. Without that word, we don't have that. Um, we don't have a way of describing that very specific political movement. And, now, I, yeah. I will say it's controversial. Among people who call themselves feminists, it's still very controversial. And there are a lot of women who are definitely on my side, our side, you know, generally of reality and wanting to protect women and girls on the basis of sex who do not call themselves feminists. It still does important work for the movement of which I'm a part. So I want to hold on to it. But I understand the arguments of women who want to get rid of it. The arguments of the women who want to get rid of it are what? So I'm thinking of one woman in particular called Kelly J. Keene. And she's she, been on the show twice, friend yeah. of the show. Uh, so, and she doesn't like it because she doesn't think that it describes what she's doing. So she calls herself a women's rights campaigner. I understand that. I think there's tremendous value in that and I love what she does. Okay, so on a scale of oppression for the female sex class, from zero to 10, zero meaning none, five meaning medium, 10 meaning like extreme, what, what, what was 1920 versus 1970 versus 2020? So 1927. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, that makes more sense. Okay. 1975 or six. Okay. Um, yeah. 2020, yeah. it's really hard because we have made so many gains. You know, I mean, I've heard a lot of people argue, and I get it, women have done so well in the West. We have made so many gains, but I just worry that gender ideology is gonna send us back. So it's just really hard to put a number on it because in some ways, on the oppression scale, I would put us in 2020 at a two or three, meaning least oppressed. But in other ways, I have to say in 2020, we're back at eight or nine. Huh. In what ways are we at an eight or nine? Specifically with regard to male violence against women is still rampant, both in you know, regular violence and sexual violence. Yeah, we repealed rape laws, marital rape laws. Marital rape laws, yeah. yeah. But you know, rape is still rampant. It hasn't gone anywhere and you know, but, but again, because this is what I focused on, because I have to focus on it, gender identity puts everything we've gained at risk. This is fascinating to me. Okay, so in like three sentences for people who are not deep into the weeds of gender ideology, what do you mean by that? Well, so having separate public bathrooms, for example, was a feminist victory. It used to be back in the day that there would just be public bathrooms and women weren't comfortable using them because there were men in them. And so that was a big reason why women stayed home. So we got, we got women only bathrooms, great. That's a mechanism by which women can actually be out in the public sphere and participate in educational arenas, sure. business arenas, all of that stuff. That is all disappearing because there are men who demand access to women's bathrooms, sports, locker rooms, prisons, etc., because they claim to be women. And, and they get those quote unquote rights or whatever one would, would want to call it, privileges or what have you. They get access to women's spaces because of gender ideology. Yes, and because of laws that have enshrined so-called gender identity in law. The reason when I asked you 1920, 1970, 2020, the reason that you ranked 2020 as higher in some senses is because of gender ideology. And is it specifically because men now have access to women's spaces? That is one of the largest aspects, yes. I mean, there's another whole set of things we could talk about around how the industry is targeting young women and girls who are uncomfortable with their female bodies, who wanna go on puberty blockers and wrong sex hormones and get surgeries. That's another whole aspect of this that we haven't even touched on. True. But yes, I mean, women are being raped in prisons by men who claim to be women. That has been documented. True. The media will not talk about it. 
also true. The media will talk about men and women's sports, although they won't use the word men That's for the most true. part. Uh, so Americans, I think, are becoming increasingly aware of the problem of men, men and boys competing in sports that are designed for women and girls. But that, you know, that's a thing. We fought for Title IX, right? Feminists fought for Title IX, which prohibits sex discrimination in the educational arena and created a robust system of female-only sports that's being decimated. I think my, my spidey sense is tingling because it doesn't seem that the number nine is justified by 2020. Like how many women in the United States, and you can include Great Britain in that if you want, or any, anywhere in the Anglosphere, how many women have been raped by men in prisons? How many have to be in order for it to be a problem? W well, one, but, but um, does that justify the confidence in nine in 2020? Because it would seem to me to be, if it were one woman, that would not seem to justify the, the number nine in terms of how problematic or whether or not society has gone backward since 1920. So, I mean, w the ubiquitousness of the problem, how endemic it is, would seem to determine what the, the, le the scale would be. Okay, so can I answer it by giving Free, a personal yes, story? Yeah. Okay, so I live in Washington, D.C which has a law in the books that prohibits discrimination on the basis of gender identity in public accommodations. For anyone who doesn't know, public accommodations includes restaurants, bars, stadiums, right. public life. Right. So, um, so I went into a restaurant where I happened to know the owner and uh, he had his three daughters there okay. on the evening in question. And uh, I was sitting at the bar talking to a friend and I felt this presence here, this very strong, male presence here, which would not be surprising if it were a very crowded bar, but this was not the case, right? There's like empty seats everywhere. So I don't wanna look, um, and so as soon as the guy gets a beer, he goes and sits down at a table behind me, and I turn, and this man has long flowing blonde hair and a big flowery dress, and he's wearing pink nail polish, and he's got like six tote bags around him. So that was creepy, right? Like I, you, women can feel when there's a male presence right next to them. I just did my best to ignore the guy and went on with my conversation with my friend and at one point wanted to use the bathroom and I went into the bathroom, there's three stalls and I can see, oh, before I went, I checked the table, he was gone, his beer was empty, his bags were gone and I thought, great, he left. So I went into the bathroom and sure enough, under one of the stalls is all of his tote bags and his pink don't nail polish. Okay. And he was the only one in there and I was in there and it really freaked me out. And I went to tell the owner and he didn't like it any more than I do because his three daughters were there, but there was nothing he could do about it legally because this man is allowed to use the women's bathroom on the basis of his so-called woman gender identity or female gender identity. Okay, so let me, let me just make sure that- That's why I gave it a nine because I experienced yeah. that myself. So tell me about the Supreme Court case related to potentially solving these kinds of issues. So the Supreme Court was recently asked to consider a case called Martinsville versus AC. Okay. AC is a female student who okay. wanted to use the boys' bathrooms okay. because she claimed to identify as a boy. Okay. The school had in place what I think is not an ideal policy, but a completely reasonable policy that probably most people would be fine with, uh, which is the school said girls in one bathroom, boys in another bathroom, uh, and a different set of single stall locked, um, single locked cell stalls yeah. that any student could use of either sex. Okay. And AC said no, she wanted to use the boys' bathroom. In this case, um, right, the school did not allow that, and so AC sued. Okay. And at the lower court level, AC won. Okay. And the school appealed to what's called the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. Right. And AC won again. Okay. So schools in the Seventh Circuit are not allowed to maintain exclusively single-sex bathrooms. Okay. Okay. There's a very similar case coming out of the Fourth Circuit, which is several years older, very similar set of facts. There's a different case in the Eleventh Circuit where a young female student called Drew Adams, same thing, wanted to use the boys' bathroom. The school said no, but the school did offer girls in this one, boys in that one, separate set of single locked stalls that any student could use on the basis that any student of either sex could use. Drew Adams didn't like that. She wanted to use the boys. She sued, and this time, by the time it got to the full 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, Drew lost. And the full 11th Circuit Court of Appeals said schools can maintain exclusively 
single sex bathrooms. Okay. And so the Supreme Court was presented with what's referred to as a circuit split. Students in the Seventh Circuit are being treated very differently from students in the Eleventh Circuit. Right. Uh, schools in other circuits are left without guidance on how to navigate all this stuff. The Supreme Court could have settled the matter by taking up the case of Martinsville and declined to do so. You have, I think, eloquently argued and given reasons and given your own kind of personal experience and testimony for why men should not be in women's bathrooms. And that is, I don't think that's a radical stance. I think that was, I don't think, I know that was normative for quite, quite a while. It's not ahistorical. But what I'm now struggling to understand is what is the problem with a woman being in a man's bathroom? Right, so in this instance, all the plaintiffs involved are all women, right? They're, and they wanted to be in the men's bathroom. That's basically your question. What's the problem with that? Well, I understand the problem with men being in women's right. bathrooms, but I don't understand the problem with women being in men's bathrooms. Well, factually speaking, if women can be in men's bathrooms, then men can be in women's bathrooms. Not, I've not, never heard of a. I've by, never heard of a scenario. Not by. That's only the case if you. Well, that, that wouldn't have. You wouldn't have to enshrine that in law. So, well, the way the laws are currently constructed, the, these cases all boil down to claims under the Equal Protection Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. Okay. And Title IX of the Civil Rights Act. And in all of the cases, the question is, can schools discriminate against students on the basis of so-called gender identity? Yes or no. The question is not, can schools discriminate against men who claim to have female gender identities in a different way than can they discriminate against women who claim to have male identities? If that were the question posed, I think you'd be totally right. Okay, so but that's let's, not the question posed. In let's these bracket cases. gender identity. Let's just say one needs to urinate, and you know there there are only so many stalls. And, and again, I'm, I don't want to be crude or vulgar here. I'm just kind of setting the scenario. And the women's room is crowded. It takes women longer sitting down, etc. And the one's like, I really need to pee. I want to go in the men's room. What's the problem with that? Probably no problem with that, especially if there's someone keeping guard. What do you mean someone keeping guard? Look, now let's say there are a bunch of men in the men's room and she just wants to go and pee. She can do that. I mean... So why... why so what's the problem with... I get the problem again. I get with men using... Like, I got it. I'm, I'm on board. But I don't get the problem with women using men's rooms. I mean, I wouldn't make that choice to do that unless it was absolutely necessary. Yeah. But if a woman wants to do that, I'm not going to complain about that. Okay, and so... So, okay, so is the issue legally then that it's not a separate but equal thing? What is the issue legally? Is that that you have to give, quote unquote, rights to, to both? What, what's, the, what's the issue legally there? Different issues come up under Title IX versus equal protection. Okay. But they're similar. The basic issue that comes up under Title IX well, the, the basic issue that comes up in both is what does the word sex mean? That's really what this comes down to. Does sex mean sex as we have all understood it to mean since the beginning of time or human society? Yeah. Or does sex include this thing called gender identity? If sex includes a thing called gender identity, then men can be women, women can be men, etc. And so when the courts are being asked to evaluate this question, what does sex mean? They're not being asked to evaluate separate questions. They're not being asked, are sometimes men women versus are sometimes women men? Okay. All it's right. just the question of whether sex encompasses gender identity. What is your interest in this issue? So like why does this matter so much to you? Part of the reason I'm so passionate about this yeah, is why? that we're losing women's rights. And I, as a feminist, I just can't go along with that. I have to speak out against it. Part of the reason I care so much about this is because I care that public policy is grounded in material reality. Well, that's <laughs> totally. We can't have a society function properly if we just throw the material reality of sex out the window. We just yeah, can't. Well, public health. You might as well throw, you have to throw out the whole peer review system, but okay. <laughs> There's that. So go back but to But part the, of the reason yeah. I care so much is because I, I'm not allowed to do anything else, right? I'm not allowed to have a career. 
because you've been canceled. Correct. Let's say that Joe Biden were here sleeping and we just, you know, nudged him to, to wake him up. Uh, what would you tell him? I would tell him that all of the Democrats in power need to just get up in front of a camera on a microphone and say a woman is an adult human female. I know happen. they're not going to do that, but that's not what you asked me. Right. Um, the next thing that Biden needs to do is rescind Executive Order 13988. This is the executive order he signed on the first day of taking office, uh, which redefines sex to include gender identity, Okay. which is a complete misconstruction of the Supreme Court's 2020 decision in Bostock. That's a whole other story. But so what I need President Biden to do is rescind that order. Do I think he's going to do that? Of course I don't. Uh, but I'm telling him this is what you need to do if you want to regain trust of voters of both sexes. Um, then I talk about what Congress needs to do under the so-called Equality Act. Okay. There's a long story behind the Equality Act. It's been around since 2015. It's still around. It would redefine sex to include gender identity for all purposes under the Civil Rights Act, including all bathrooms, etc. All of it. The Equality Act needs to go. Then there's a bunch of stuff that also has to happen administratively. Okay. What do Republicans need to do? Like, let's say that we, 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 got, we got Trump in here. I was so, trying to think of something derogatory to say about him, but there's just so much I don't even know where to begin. But let's say we got him in here, and uh, what what what? And then you have you know a minute to tell him what would what would you, what would you tell him about this season? So my Republican friends won't forgive me if I don't say on camera right now that what, what Republicans need to do is to get a spine. So recently he was asked. Uh, the former president was asked, can a man become a woman? And he stumbled through an absolutely nonsensical answer. Look, get up there, Republicans, and say, no, a man cannot become a woman. One of the most frustrating things in this whole thing, I'm on the left, as you know, but I do work with Republicans and conservative organizations. Republicans, even though they're the only ones who are pushing back at all, still, for the most part, seem to have accepted the lie that there is a coherent category of people called transgender. And so even when Republicans are pushing back against, say, men and women's sports, yeah. they'll say, this, it's a problem to have transgender athletes in women's sports. Stop it. Just say men. The issues that you've identified as important, will they be worse or will they be ameliorated under a Democrat or a Republican administration? So one thing that's really interesting is we are seeing Democrats at the state level buck the party trend. Not a whole lot, but a handful. A handful of Democrats are saying no men in women's sports, no men in women's prisons, stop mutilating kids. They're saying that, and I'm very grateful to them for it, and I'm personally sending them copies of my book to thank them for their votes. I am not naive enough to think that the Democrats in power at the federal level are suddenly going to do an about face. Biden is not going to say, oops, sorry. Kamala Harris is not going to say, oops, sorry. Nancy Pelosi, like no, Schumer, none of them are going to do it, which is why we need a new crop of Democrats at the state level and at the federal level uh, who will do it. Okay, so would you rather have a gender identity believing Democrat as a president or a gender critical pro-choice Republican? I would be willing to consider voting for a Republican who will absolutely hold the line at the material reality of sex and the sex-based rights of women and girls and also protect abortion rights. I don't see that happening, but if such a candidate were to arise, I would give that candidate serious consideration. I should say WDI USA is a nonprofit and we do not endorse candidates. I'm speaking solely for myself right, for here. yourself, solely for yourself, got that, that's good. So recently you had a tweet about sex-specific care and federal funding. Talk to us about that. So as of early 2021, doctors who receive federal funding are being told that they're not allowed to discriminate against their patients on the basis of their patients' so-called gender identities. And so one thing that has come out of this is that we see a case in federal court, which is currently before the Fifth Circuit, where a doctor who receives federal funding under the Affordable Care Act has a patient who's male and who may have prostate cancer. And the patient basically said to his doctor, no doctor, I identify as a woman, therefore I can't have a prostate, therefore I can't have prostate cancer. The doctor was concerned that he could not provide sex specific potential life-saving care to this male patient because doing so would discriminate 
against his patient on the basis of his patient's gender identity in violation of federal law. So maybe I'm being extremely naive. What's the problem with that? Just let the guy die? Well, yeah. No, I'm like, I'm being really serious. Like, if that's what the person wants, what's the problem? Well, the doctor has a professional obligation to provide care. Now, I'm no, not an no, expert in no, that, no, so no, I don't no, know. that's not true. Well, I mean, if you're asking, should the doctor not have sued? No, I mean, the doctor has a professional obligation to do no harm. The doctor doesn't have an obligation to provide anybody any care. Fair enough. That's not my area of expertise. But if your question is just the... Why not just let the guy die? Yeah, well, why not? That's a question for the doctor. I don't know why. Okay. But, but it, en it ended up becoming a class action. Yeah. So there are a lot of doctors who are concerned about this. All right, so I want to go back to the trans thing. So there are different types of transition, tra and again, transition, uh, surgically, uh, socially, hormonally. W what, what are your thoughts about that for people on their 18th birthday and beyond? So if we're talking about surgery, we're basically talking about cosmetic surgery. We're talking about people having their body modified. Take Dylan Mulvaney, right? Dylan right. Mulvaney had his facial feminization surgery to look more feminine. Should Dylan Mulvaney be legally allowed to do that? I mean, sure. If someone is genuinely passing, does that matter to you whether, like I was, I, was, I had lunch with um, Deidre, the economist Deidre McCluskey. And the waiter, we had a couple of different waiters, and they, they both addressed Deidre McCluskey as ma'am. And then Deidre McCluskey went into the woman's room. Um, does it matter at all if they're passing? So one thing worth noting is that it is generally much easier for a female person to pass as male than for a male person to pass like Buck Angel. as a woman. Yeah. So, and I think that that is just a result of it just being easier to put on bulk and weight and stuff like that. It's harder for men to convince anybody that they're actually women. Okay. So having said that, um, the only reason the question arises, and it's a totally fine question, the only reason the question arises is because we have this thing called transition, which is based on the idea that people should be able to lie about their sex. And so my answer is, no, it doesn't matter. People should still be using facilities that are in alignment with their actual sex. Oh, okay. Yeah, I and do understand that there are, there are questions about if someone truly does pass, then, then why, how would I even know? Okay, and if someone wants to, uh, as Travis always says, alleviate their gender distress, you, how, after their 18, on the 18th birthday, would you be okay with them getting what you've termed cosmetic surgery to have their genitals lopped off. I don't know that that could be legally prohibited, but I'm just saying I would want those people to become, uh, to, to come to accept themselves as their actual sex. I think that's much more compassionate. You know, a lot of times TERFs get accused of being, you know, mean and uncompassionate, non-compassionate. Why can't we just be nice? I think the nicest thing and the most compassionate thing we can do is to help people, children or adults, to accept themselves as their actual sex. Even if someone legitimately wants to have, we, we had someone here who uh, had bottom surgery, had no testicle and no penis, and he self-identified as a gay man. So you, would you be, do you have a moral problem with him, a social problem? The taxes are another thing, like who pays for that, that's another thing. Um, would, would you have an, an, any issues with once someone is 18 undergoing those procedures? I mean, these procedures are still dangerous, right? I mean, if, if the question is, should it be legal? I suppose it should be legal. I wouldn't okay. want to criminalize that. If the question is, do I want these people to, to take these steps? No, I don't. Because the, do you the want them to live the kind of life they want to lead? I, I want them to live. And people who have these surgeries and hormones often have really, really difficult health difficulties. Now, if they want to take that on... Lifelong medical patients, in a sense. Yeah. I mean, I, I just don't think that's a healthy thing. I think it's maybe the same question as if a person wants to uh, commit long-term suicide via heroin addiction, yeah. shouldn't we just let them live their life? I mean, arguably, yeah. sure, well, that's I, a libertarian position. I think the difference is that people don't want to commit suicide through long-term heroin addiction, maybe, maybe, maybe an analogy would be 
if someone wanted to lop off their leg. Um, and I have, I'm, I guess maybe that is my libertarian tendencies. I have no problem with anybody who wants to lop off their leg. If you want to lop off their leg, I mean, I, there's nothing I can do about it. I mean, what are you supposed to do? P post a policeman at every, make every Luke's house, make sure he doesn't lop off his leg? I mean, <laughs> I mean there, are logistical, there are logistical difficulties to that. Um, but I think that's, I, I don't really, I, I think, I guess, I guess then the question should be. Well, can I actually answer that with the, yeah. respect to that analogy? Because I literally just a few weeks ago read an article about this. Yeah. It was an article about a man who literally wanted to lop off his leg. Yeah, yeah. And he couldn't find a doctor to do it yeah. because the doctors had ethical problems doing that. Yeah. So I guess I understand the libertarian argument that sure, let the guy lop off his leg if he wants to. So this guy had a wife. I mean, who am I to tell a guy not to lop off his leg? Sure. He had a wife who was not necessarily comfortable with him just doing that because that had implications for his ability to work. It had implications for you know his ability to participate in um, domestic responsibilities. She was not necessarily on board with it and he wanted to go forward with it anyway. And it's like, that's where my, my sympathy for the libertarian argument kind of ends. When people's choices to live life yeah, how not, they I'm want to affect people. I'm not a libertarian just people. for the record, yeah, yeah. I get it, but I just think there are other considerations. I guess then the question becomes, what role should shame play? I think, I think shame has been weaponized historically about the wrong things, uh, homosexuality being a chief example of that. What role do you think shame should play as a, corrective, as a social corrective mechanism to keep people from going to crazy town? I think shame plays a role. I think, I think it's not an easy question to answer. But I do think shame plays a role, especially when we're talking about, okay, so let me just back up for a second and say it's really important when we talk about trans or gender identity to distinguish between men who are claiming to have a trans identity because they have a sexual fetish versus young girls and women who are really sincerely confused. Yeah. Our society lumps both groups of people up uh, under the category trans. I right. think it's really dangerous. There are very different, it's d different sets of issues. I am not about to shame a young woman who is trying to escape womanhood um, because she's stressed out about what she sees as womanhood in our society today. I'm not about to shame her for being confused about it, for wanting to get out of it, or for taking steps to get out of it. I will welcome her back when she accepts herself as female, and I hope she does. I hope all of them do. I'm not gonna shame those young women. The men who are acting out a sexual fetish, I absolutely think there's a role for shame there. So I'm gonna throw you a curveball question. You're from the United States, you live in the US, you live in DC. Obesity is a problem in the US. Do you think we should shame people into eating certain foods to, to lose weight? I have not thought about that because I don't really think about that issue, but... So shame does play a kind of role. I mean, sh shame does, and I'm not, I don't think, so my answer is I do not think we should shame anybody for, for that. I don't think we should shame anybody. But uh, I'm thinking in terms of the guardrails seem to have come off society at the same time that post-modernity and the post-modern age has seeped into the culture. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if we can kind of reinstitutionalize or re-socialize normative values that we've lost to make it sure that society functions in, in, a, in, a, in a way that's civil. And I, I'm, I've been thinking about that in terms of the trans issue. So I think this is a really, really difficult issue. And yeah, I agree. here's why. Um, I am not interested in going back to a place where our society was marked by raging homophobia. I'm not interested in going back to a place where men and women were, we still are, but even more so confined to certain styles of presentation. Right? I'm thinking about, I don't want to go back to a time when women had to wear corsets. I don't want to go back to a time where women uh, had to bind their feet. Obviously, sex stereotypes still exist, but they're less rigid now, for sure. I don't want to go back to those rigid sex stereotypes. So when we talk about men in dresses, 
right? A lot of people sort of casually talk about men in dresses, trans, men in dresses. We use this kind of language. I don't want men or women to be confined by sex role stereotypes, but I do think it's really important that we do have some sort of norms and values. Okay. So I think it's hard to find the line. Okay, so this is what I'm also struggling to understand. I don't understand what the problem is with a guy in a dress. This is... Like, I legitimately don't understand the problem with that. This is what I'm saying. I, I think it's a really difficult line, right? So I... People in this space talk a lot about how, let's go back to the 80s. David Bowie was experimenting with all sorts of dresses and sparkly outfits and things. Nobody was confused about his sex, right? Nobody thought that made him a woman. So I think if we lived in a time where, if we could get rid of this whole idea that somehow people can be the opposite sex, then I think we should be much more free to have men in dresses and you know, women wearing cargo pants and whatever. The problem that we are living with is that we, we've got this thing that's, that, that's called gender identity that says if you are a person who wears cargo pants, you're a man, and if you're a person who wears dresses, you're a woman. That's the problem. Okay, so I really realize my fashion is, uh, I don't even know what a cargo, cargo pants are since I only wear jeans, but so, so Reed, pull up a pair of cargo pants so I could take a look at them over there. Um, Okay, so what if people didn't think they were a woman, but people treated them... Well, let me, okay, let me, let's go back. Skip out the cargo pants, skip out the whole thing. So let's, because I'm trying to think through this now. What are cargo pants, by the way? I just want to see, because it's going to be in my head. Oh, those so women don't wear those. I guess lesbians do, but that's another story. Okay, so if we didn't think of people... They can, anybody can think of themselves as the opposite sex. But if we didn't think of them as the opposite sex, if we thought this is, here's a guy in a dress, or here's a guy who's undergone bottom surgery, or what have you, is the claim that that would be less of a problem? It's the, it's the problem only becomes when we think of these people as the opposite sex, then they have certain rights associated with that. Like they get F on their driver's license and then that gives them access to female space. Is that the problem? That's a big part of the problem. Okay. But, but the, and a related problem is um, that the extent to which we associate stereotypes with sex. So someone who's not involved in this, a normie, if you will, and, and they, they see what's happening in society and they're confused. And I would put many liberals in this category if they listen to NPR in particular. They're just, they know something's off, they're confused, they don't know exactly what it is. What do you say to them? I ask questions. So I've had this happen several times. People, and I write in the introduction to the book, there's this concept of peak trance. So this is when yeah. liberals, who have kind of been going along with the idea that trans is real, and that it's an important civil rights movement, start to think, okay, hold on. I'll give you a specific example. Yeah. There's a woman whose daughter was competing on an Ivy League swim team. And not Penn, a different Ivy League swim team. And this woman sort of vaguely knew about Caitlyn Jenner and the Vanity Fair cover and the this and the awards and glamor. And she kind of thought it was all weird, but she wasn't too worried about it. Right? She's a very stereotypical suburban liberal mom, pro-abortion rights, votes Democrat. Kind of thought something was weird, but didn't really pay attention. Until she saw the name Leah Thomas on the Penn swim roster. And she thought, because um, she had a daughter on her own Ivy League swim team, who's Leah Thomas? Where did Leah come from? Why is Leah all of a sudden showing up as a senior? Is Leah a transfer student? Maybe, but she had never heard of Leah before. So she digs in and she finds that Leah is Will and she's like, whoa, what is going on? Intact, I might add. Mm -hmm. So she does her research and right. she finds out, holy shit, right. this is everywhere. This is not right, right, a couple right. of glamour photos. Somehow she found me, I don't know how, but we had a Zoom call and I was like, yeah, this has been going on for a really long time. That's peak trance. That's when you're like, okay, no more. This is not okay. And then once you start to see it, you can't unsee it. This, by yeah. the way, is why most media outlets will not talk about this. 
will not platform a lefty radical feminist like myself because they don't want anyone to know that lefty radical feminists can actually have very productive conversations with normal liberals who are just waking up. And if, if someone's watching this and they're a dad, like I'm a dad, what, why should a, a guy care about this? Well, guys should care, dads in particular should care if their daughters uh, are playing sports. Guys should definitely care if their daughters are in school. There is a horrific case out of New Mexico. A 12 year old girl went into serious mental decline and her parents couldn't figure out why. And finally, they read her diary, of course, a privacy violation, but they were terrified for their daughter. And she had written all about being raped in the bathroom by, by a guy who identifies as a girl. Yeah, I was gonna ask, how common is that? that that because I don't hear about that often. I mean, how common is it that women get raped in bathrooms by trans women? I mean, it's common enough that it's a serious concern. There's right. that New Mexico case I just mentioned. Um, like in the U.S. Uh, in 2023, like how many times? I, I mean, I really have no idea. Like how many times does that happen? Like more than a hundred? You really have to pay attention to feminist media to to know, but we, or you can read my book. But I talk about. Um, it happened in Loudoun County, Virginia. It happened in an uh, area south of uh, San Diego. It happened in Dayton, Ohio. It's definitely happening. So it was like, at a hun is it 100, 1,000? I don't, I don't know the exact yeah, number. I, I mean, either. how would we know? How would we know? Because in they part, wouldn't report it? What? Because they wouldn't report it? Often, they, often these go unreported. Or if they go reported, they're reported as a woman committing the crime. Yeah, Andrew Doyle writes about that in his book, The New Puritans. Yeah. Right, here's my last question to you. And I will fully admit this is just my own thing. Okay. I'm going to be blunt with you. Great. You strike me as a fighter. You strike me as someone who doesn't take shit. Okay, where's this going? Is that, am I right? Yeah. You, sure. s you strike me as someone who's outspoken. Am I right? Sure. You strike me as someone who's tenacious. Okay. Am I right? I guess. Reed's dying over there, but I'm gonna ask you anyway. Okay. Why on earth would you, and if you could help me understand this, I swear to God I would be so grateful to you. Why in the world would you not take steps to prevent yourself from being afraid in a woman's room if you know there are men there. Why on earth would you not do that? I would. Have you? The one time I encountered a man, I just left. That was the step yeah, it, I took to uh, keep so, myself safe. So, so, so your step is to hope you can leave? Other, are you asking why I don't arm myself? Well, that would be one <laughs> step. That would be one solution. Why don't you do that? Well, I don't arm myself because I'm not a gun person. I mean, okay. do I carry pepper spray? Do I yeah, carry do you? I don't. I could. Okay, so please explain to me why someone like yourself, a fighter, tenacious, tough, doesn't do what I would consider to be an extraordinarily common sense thing. Like, what is it in your thinking process that prevents you from thinking what I would say, and be very blunt with you clearly about that issue because you clearly understand that this is a problem. I mean, are you assuming I haven't taken self-defense courses? Like what? I, be, I like, have, I have taken plenty of self-defense courses. I have taken plenty of steps to protect myself. I just go back to, I could be a black belt and I still don't want to share a bathroom with a guy. No, no, I, I get that. Like I, I, I grok that, I grok that. Let me put it on myself. Let me put it on myself. And I've had this conversation with Reed, with Luke, with other people, and I, for the life of me, I cannot understand this thinking. I, I just truly cannot understand this thinking. So if you could help me, what I would be so what's, grateful What's the you. thinking that you don't understand? I do not what understand why people would place themselves in positions of, of impotency in the world why they would not take steps, for example, to buy, if you don't like guns, great, pepper spray, get a blue belt in jujitsu. Like, take some steps to not hope that you can get out of the bathroom, sure. to not hope that the manager 
will intervene, to not hope that the Supreme Court will pass a law. I don't think, I, I don't know anyone who engages in that thinking. Okay, so what do you do? Well, but you don't have pepper spray or mace. I don't have pepper spray or mace. I could have pepper spray or mace. I could. That's, the, the answer to your question is more laziness than principle. I don't have pepper spray or mace because I just haven't gotten around to getting it. Okay, so help me understand. Assuming this. it's legal. Laws, okay, so, I need, so, I need to, laws vary across the United yeah, I, States about I, whether, I, what you can have. Okay? I'm obviously not telling you to do something illegal. I'm just trying to figure sure. this out for myself. So you of all people, and you document this in your book, you know that it's just a problem you know that women are getting raped. Yeah. So why wouldn't you arm, like, why, why wouldn't you take steps so that to increase your confidence, to decrease the likelihood if you found yourself in that situation for something untoward happening to you? That's my question to I, you. But I don't think like that. I have taken steps. Again, like the reason I don't have pepper spray is just laziness. Of course, maybe I'll do that this afternoon when I go back to my hotel room. Uh, okay, I don't so, have a principle against people taking steps to okay. protect themselves. I absolutely think okay. women should take self-defense. So the fact that you have not taken steps means that you must think that the problem is so insignificant and so unlikely to affect you that it's not worth your taking the step to try to act as some kind of prophylactic against No, them. I don't think that at all. I think it could happen at any time. Well then, it's just okay you if know, you the, thought the that. Ultimate, the ultimate answer to your question is yeah. why don't I just stay home? No, no, but no, no. If you truly thought it could happen at any time, like if I thought that you know, I don't know, I could be, uh, you know, a, a victim of a marauding elephant or something. Like if if, if I thought I could be, a, 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 you know, w whatever whatever the, the the phenomena would be, would it not be rational to take steps? to prevent that from happening Of to course me. it would. Okay, so why thing. don't you do that? I have. <laughs> I have taken self-defense. Are you asking me why I haven't bought pepper spray? What self-defense have you taken? I don't remember the name of the self-defense. We, don't, we, will, we can edit this thing. out. We here's, can edit this out, but right. you're trying, I'm just trying to do this to help myself. But here's what I'm also trying How to say. How many self-defense classes have you taken? I don't remember, but here's the thing. Yeah. And it gets back to the guy at the bar. Yes. Every second I'm out, and about yeah. since I was, I don't know, 16. Yeah. I've been aware that I am constantly at risk of male violence. Okay, but you're making your argument for me. You're making my argument. Well, so again, the alternative is to stay home. No, that's not the alternative. I mean, yeah, I mean, the most extreme of cases, the argument is to stay home, but like, you know, I've talked about this. Is your more. argument that I should buy pepper spray? That's a piece of the argument. Yeah. Sure. So that's a piece of the argument. Okay, I'm with you. Okay, An another piece of the argument is that, like, if you, I, this is what's so fascinating to me. Like, it's so fascinating to me. Like, I get that Reed doesn't think that. Th I get that he believes that this is so minuscule of a happening that it's not worth him putting time into this. Like, I get that. And I get that there's nothing I can say to him. He'll never change his behavior. These guys are gonna be impotent in the face of the world. That's just the way it is. I get that, I grok that. But what I don't understand is you. Because your book is very specific about the dangers of this. Yes. You even just said to me that you're at constant risk of male violence. And I think that that's largely correct. I mean, I don't know who you're hanging out with, but that's largely correct. Right. It would seem to me that a rational response to that, there are certain rational responses to that to decrease the likelihood of that happening to you. And so I, I'm just trying to figure out, like I get why these guys don't do it because they, they, don't, they think the risk is so minuscule it's not worth the work, putting in any work. But I don't get why you don't do it. Why, why don't I? Well, like why don't you get a blue belt in jujitsu? Time. But you know, again, We'll, get, we'll edit just, this all out, but I'm just trying to understand this for myself. I, I just assumed, again, it gets back to the differences in our experiences. I've just been assuming this whole time, yeah. for decades now, that every time I leave the house, yeah. there's a possibility that I'm going to be overpowered by some man. Right. These Look, guys don't assume that, so they don't take steps to prevent it. But you assume it, so it would seem to me to be rational for you to take steps to prevent it. Of course it, it would. Uh, there's no disagreement here. Okay. I would wear a bulletproof vest if there were a, a, a mass incidence of rash. If I thought the likelihood of me being shot was anything above non-trivial, then yes, I would.
Okay, but I think what we think is the non-trivial then. Well, that's why I, I don't, so you guys just have a different risk assessment, but she doesn't, that's the difference. It's just life is a small woman. I don't know what to tell you. I know a small woman who could kick the shit out of everybody in this room in about, I don't know, a minute and a half. And there's literally nothing anybody could do and about it. And she's done all the training to get herself there. Yeah, Amanda Lowen is her name. Cool. Yeah, I just haven't done it. Would it be rational? Of course. Yeah, okay, so you, okay, so, okay, that's what I was looking for. So it would be rational for you to take steps to decrease the likelihood for you being raped or assaulted. Sure, okay. absolutely. All right, so we're totally, all right, so there is no, you're right, there is no disagreement. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Because I've been struggling with that. That's the one thing that I've been struggling with that I've not gotten a straight answer from. So here's what I, where I, where I think I'm hearing you coming from. There yeah. are women who say, I shouldn't have to, and that's the end of it for them. Well, that, they're just idiots. Oh, okay, so you're, you were assuming that I took that view. No, I was, I was genuinely curious about, given the fact that you know the risks, yeah. why you don't mediate those risks. Right, laziness is the answer. Okay, well that's, okay, now I got you. <laughs> All right, okay. Real quick about your book, tell us about your book. Thank you, it's called The Reckoning, How the Democrats and the Left Betrayed Women and Girls. It goes through all the ways in which men have been permitted to invade women's sports spaces, prisons, etc. It goes through all the ways in which children and young adults have been harmed um, by so-called gender ideology. It explains um, the queering of the American political left and gets into why a lot of this is happening. It talks about uh, the medical industry and pharma and their complicity. It also goes into the complicity of the Republican Party because I don't think they're doing quite enough to, to stop this. And it talks about uh, some other sectors that are pushing back, including, for example, some judges who have written some outstanding opinions, some Democrats at the state level who are bucking the party trend, and, of course, the TERFs. And you're saying this is someone on the left? Yes. And have you been accused of being on the right? Sure. All the time. <laughs> Welcome to the club. And what is your response when people accuse you of being on the right? It's just silly. I mean... I, I, I'm happy to show you my voter registration card that says I'm a registered Democrat. I'm you know, happy to talk about my lefty credentials. Mm. Um, and I also think it's really interesting the extent to which so many people on the left are handing the right common sense yeah, arguments. It been, is so frustrating. Yeah, that's been my claim for a while. I, I endorsed uh, Andrew Yang last year, but that has not prevented a single person from telling me that I'm on the right. Right. Uh, Again, people just get to make shit up and say whatever they want to say. Yeah, that's post-truth. Uh, just just very, very quickly, have you found that when you've asked people to have conversations with you about this, people who have substantive disagreements with you, what has been the response? Refusal to engage at all, for the most part. For the most part, refusal to engage, oh, oh, that's changing. Okay, so how do you know you're, you, when you send them an email that they weren't all lost? You're talking about Democrats in power? No, like all of them. <laughs> when I send who an email? When you send the people who disagree with you invitations to conversations, how do you know that every single one of those emails oh, wasn't lost? I don't. But I'm talking about social media. Or I'm talking about, for example... Because that's what I was accused of. Oh. Inviting people to talk and the, the emails All the lost? emails were lost. They, they were oh. literally all lost. Yeah, I mean... And then I was accused of not sending them in the first place. I see. And Aaron not sending them... And, and no, nobody said, do, do, are you accused of that as well? I have not been accused of that, no. You know, but the, the, engaging with the legacy media, for example. How many letters to the editor have I written that went unanswered? Now, there's nothing wrong with the New York Times ignoring a letter to the editor. They sure. do it all the time. But <laughs> for the last nine years, I can't tell you the number of letters to the editor, op-eds, other kinds of opinion pieces I have submitted to the Washington Post, the New York Times, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of them go completely ignored. And that is why the leftist yeah. feminist critique of so-called gender identity does not get introduced. And, and when you want to have conversations with people who disagree with you, do, what do they, do they just not answer your calls or your emails or what do they, they just ignore you? Yeah, for the most part, they just ignore me. It's like the woman I told you about, my friend who put her ears over her okay. hands over her ears and okay. said, I don't want to talk about it. All right, so let me ask you a question. Then. So when, when they ignore you, are you then accused of only talking to people who agree with you? I don't know that I've had that accusation. Oh, but the, well, but on the, welcome. But you you, you just wait. Just, it's coming. So I got, I got <laughs> invited to this like very moderate podcast 
based in Missouri, and we were gonna talk about gender and identities, and it was gonna be me, Jamie Reed, who blew the whistle on the Missouri Clinic, yeah, yeah. Uh, and Monica Harris, who runs the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, as well as a guy who runs some sort of LGBTQ thing in Missouri, and a young woman who runs a queer law project. Oh. And at the very last minute, those two just canceled. They just canceled. They huh. would not share a platform. I can't believe anybody would just cancel at the last minute after they so, yeah, said. So they just ignore. After they said that they would be there and there was an agreement. <laughs> I can't believe it. Well, Reed, Reed can't believe Shocking. it. It's amazing. It's amazing to me. You know, one of the um, most famous people we've had on the show is uh, Mr. Menno. I don't know if you know who he is, but if not, he's like the Brad Pitt of the gay world. He is the he was the queer of the year. Was it was the gay of the year. He was the gay of the year. Oh my God, we got to redo that then. We, we had, I got to meet him here. You met the gay of the year. When I was here uh, last October. Yeah. You met the gay of the Out year. At a Kelly J. Keene. Wow, what an honor know. that was. So you met the, the most gay man of the... The, the gayest of the gays, He yeah. is truly the gayest of the gay. Anybody <laughs> else is a pale shadow of a man. Um, but it was, it, it was interesting m meeting, meeting the gay of the year. Uh, I, I didn't, I didn't, hadn't prepared for such, such an honor. I don't think any of us had prepared for such an honor. Did he sing? Uh, no, but he had a kind of uh, song in his voice, <laughs> kind of an intrinsic song in his voice. Um, okay, <laughs> so where can people find you? Thanks so much. Go to womensdeclarationusa.com. It's the website of Women's Declaration International's U.S. chapter, of which I serve as president. If you're a woman, join us. We'd love to have you. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter, at Kdansky, and at Facebook, the same thing. And on my Substack, karadansky.substack.com. Great. Well, thank you so much for having a conversation. Appreciate thank you it. for having me. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for watching. Everything we do is under the umbrella of the National Progress Alliance, nationalprogressalliance.org. It's a nonprofit, independent 501c3. Your generous donations keep us going and keep fueling content like this. So please help us out, make a donation. We very much appreciate it. Thank you.